He would give police a few different stories about what actually happened, but in the end, it was plants that did him in. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Patty Wolasic. Viewer discretion is advised. It was very late at night on April 3rd, 2002. Police in Guilford, New York, which is in upstate New York, were called about a car accident. A truck had driven into, a, into Guilford Lake, and there was possibly a victim in the bottom of the water. The person who called police or had someone called police was Peter Wolasic. His wife was Patty Wolasic, who was a nurse at a local hospital, which was actually called the hospital. So when police get there, they have one of their uh, divers, trained divers, go into the lake. And they, this diver goes down there and in fact finds a female. And she appears to not be struggling or attempting to swim or anything. She's completely motionless. So the diver grabs her and he says he, he launches up with his feet and they go to the surface. He would later say that, you know, usually after 20 or 30 minutes or so, even if a victim has drowned and appears dead, there is that small window of time where you could possibly revive them. And so she was rushed to the hospital, but there was no saving her. She was pronounced dead at the the hospital, and it was 35-year-old Patty Wolasic. She was born Patricia Shoemaker, who would later go on to marry a man named Peter, and they married in 1996 in a very surprise elopement. According to Patty's sister, Patty did not have exactly the best upbringing. When Patty was a baby, her birth father left the scene and never really came back, and then her stepdad was basically a piece of shit. As she got older, Patty would basically go to alcohol to ease her, her pain, her emotional pain and suffering. And she began to have an issue with alcohol. Basically, she became an alcoholic. But when she met Peter Wolasic in 1996 or sometime before that, she began to turn her life around. She was really hoping to get rid of this alcohol issue and move on with her life. And that's exactly what happened. Her and Peter would go on to have a couple of kids. Patty has one son and three daughters, from what I understand, but I don't think all of the children came from Peter. She herself had a lot of siblings. She had, I think, three brothers and four sisters and then amongst them, she had 12 nieces and nephews. But by 1996, 1997, she began to pursue a nursing career and she would get her nursing degree and then she would get a job at the hospital. And so police now at this point want to know, how did we get to this point? She was turning her life around. She was definitely on the upswing. She had a really good job where her coworkers described her as a fantastic nurse a really caring and loving woman. Her kids, her family said she was happy. She was becoming more content with life. Everything was going well. And so how did she end up at the bottom of a lake? Was this an accident? Well, by all accounts at first, it sure appeared that way. According to Peter Wolasic, he said that Patty had got off from her nursing job that night. She came home and he says that she was supposed to pick up the kids from the babysitter, but she didn't. And, and this is all according to Peter because obviously they can't talk to Patty. He said that there was like a misunderstanding or some miscommunication that happened and they were going to get into the truck together to go pick up the kids. Well, Peter said that before they left, Patty did have have a couple of alcoholic drinks. And on the way to the babysitter, they're on this sort of dark kind of road that's, that goes by Guilford Lake. And it's this really like scenic and picturesque type neighborhood. There's houses all along this road and it's completely fenced off except for one section that has no fence there. Well, According to Peter, Patty was smoking a cigarette and when she went to flick the cigarette out of the car, it caught wind and it went back into the truck and it began to burn the seat. And so both of them got distracted by it. And then according to Peter, when they look up, they see a deer in the road. Patty 
he says, begins to swerve really at a very sharp angle towards the direction of the lake. And that's when they just so happen to go through the only opening on this entire road and continues to go down and they go into the lake. And then the truck begins to submerge right away, he said. Peter says he manages to get out of the vehicle from the passenger side window. He then says he tries to grab Patty and he continues to struggle to pull her up, but he basically she slips out of his grasp and she begins to go to the bottom of the lake. But he says that she was still in the truck when he ended up going to the surface and running to one of the nearby homes to get 911 to come out. The thing about that is he claimed she was in the truck, but Patty was found outside of the truck. She was not anywhere near to be in it. What makes matters a little stranger is that both of the doors were locked. The driver's side window, when eventually the truck was pulled out, was not rolled down, and that's where Patty was. They don't know how she got out of the vehicle, if both of the doors were locked. And if she got out of the vehicle, why didn't she swim up to the surface? When they pulled the vehicle from the truck, there was absolutely no damage. There was the, the front bumper had no damage whatsoever, not even a dent. There was no physical damage inside the vehicle. There was no broken windows. There were there was nothing, nothing to indicate that this was an actual kind of sort of high speed crash into the lake. There was nothing. Back at the hospital, Peter Wolasik is being treated by the hospital staff. Oddly enough, the doctor that had been working with Patty that very night was there treating him because this was still the same evening. The doctors made note of something peculiar. This is April in New York. It's cold. The water is very, very, very cold. They noticed a couple of things right off the bat with Peter. He, His lips were not blue. There was no discoloration to his lips or his skin. He was not shivering. He was not, not even, not even at all, like not even like a subtle shiver whatsoever. They also tested his body temperature. His body temperature was like literally just below the normal body temperature of someone that you would have. By medical certainty, if he was in waters in New York for even just a few minutes being submerged and then trying to get Patty out and swimming up to the surface, he should be showing signs of hypothermia. He showed no signs of it. His body temperature should have been way lower than it was, and he should have been shivering even for quite some time after the incident took place. But none of that was present. Now that is circumstantial evidence that's not like hard proof of anything because obviously things can happen. Things that we're not used to can still happen. At the hospital, he was really adamant to police test Patty's blood alcohol level. She was drunk. She was drunk. Despite him saying that all of this was an accident, he now wanted them to test her blood alcohol level. So they did. Her blood alcohol level was actually well be below the legal limit. It was at point like 055 or something like that indicative of her having maybe two drinks or so. She wasn't drunk. The coroner would determine that she had like a couple like little bruises on her body and she had some petechial hemorrhaging on her lungs, but there was very little to almost no water in her lungs. And he did state, the coroner stated that it still is possible to drown without getting water in your lungs. It's also possible to be submerged in water after you've died. My dogs are deciding to play right now. Dog break. <laughs> anyway, it is also possible that a person can be put into the water after death and also not have water into their lungs. However, the coroner had really no choice but to rule that a possible drowning is what they would say. They could not, they could not say with definitive proof that she drowned. Okay, we need to have a Molly break. So Molly wants to say hi because she's bouncing around like a crazy lady. Aren't you? Aren't you? You're having fun with your brother. So we needed to have a little, a calm, happy break, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, back to normal. So the other evidence they found was that there were these like little seed pods in past from the burdock plant. The burdock plant, and I know I've seen something like these before, like they're like really thistly type seed pods that if you like even just go 
kind of close to them. They stick to you, right? But yeah, they found them in her hair, on her clothes. It was just unusual because they don't grow in water. So they were curious. They wanted to know how they got onto her. They actually had divers go into the bottom of this lake and the divers of the on the prosecutor side said they found absolutely no sign, no traces of burdock plains anywhere. They also searched along this entire road by the lake itself or near the lake and you know in the, these houses yards and whatnot there were they checked the vegetation they checked all the plants no sign of burdock plants anywhere in this area however when they went to the Wallasics home they did find a lot of like overgrown type weeds and stuff like that the lawn wasn't really kept well and they found in fact burdock plants just outside of their home and when they checked even closer they noticed that there was one branch that would have had these burdock seeds on seed pods but those seed pods had broken off and they were missing and on one of those broken branches where the seed pods were missing they found a single strand of hair that hair would later come back to matching Patty Wolasic's hair. So they're like, okay, how did how did that happen? How does she get all this these burdock things on her in her hair, on her clothes, and then she just went about her business as normal? I mean, you're gonna notice these things on you. So why didn't she like pluck them out or anything if they were on her when she was still alive? Then they had someone re-examine the actual road of where the incident took place. They had accident recreation experts come in. They would, there because first of all, there was no skid marks at all on the road. There was, because Peter had said that she had swerved very quickly at a very sharp angle and that would have absolutely created skid marks, but there were none. They did find normal tire tracks on the dirt going down that path and on the grass near where this all happened. And they were able through recreating it with all their fancy science and math that I don't, still don't under, will never understand, were able to calculate the exact angle the truck drove into this area and then eventually down the hill into the lake. And they were able to determine based on all of that, how fast the car was going. They said it was not going any fast than like 30 to 35 miles per hour. Peter had said that she had gone super fast, like 40, 50 miles per hour. That wasn't true. It almost appeared as if the car was just driving normally down this path at a normal speed. When the accident recreation experts examined the truck, like I said earlier, there was no front bumper damage. There was no damage at all to the vehicle. There was no indications that this vehicle had been in any type of accident whatsoever. So what they did is they took several vehicles, they took like vans, they took trucks, and they went the same speed that they calculated that Patty's vehicle was going. They drove it into the lake and just to see what would happen. And every single time there was damage, bad damage to the bumper, the front bumper of the vehicle. No matter what vehicle they drove in there, there was a lot of dense and severe damage to the front of the car. At the speed that they calculated she would have been going and drove into that lake. They did it at the same angle. They did everything the way it should have happened and how come the truck they were in had no damage, but every vehicle they tested ended up having damage. They also noticed that trucks like the size of Patty's truck and other vans and stuff because Peter had said the moment they went into the water that it was like sunk it was they were already like underneath the water but all the vehicles they tested took anywhere between like a minute and a half to four minutes to actually submerge below the surface of the water which means there was there was at least a few minutes that both of them could have easily gotten out of the vehicle before the car actually sank. And then when they forensically examined the vehicle, they noticed that in the bed of the truck, there was a cell phone and a pager, both that belonged to Patty that she always had on her, like her, I think it was like her hospital pager that she had clipped onto her, that she was still wearing when she got home from work. They also noticed a strand of hair in the back of the vehicle. That hair also matched Patty. So why was Patty's cell phone and pager and her hair found in the bed of the truck when Patty was supposed to be driving the truck? 
didn't make any sense. So then the coroner would re-examine the body and they took some kind of further looks into things and they actually determined that Patty did not drown. She actually suffocated. Somebody physically suffocated her. And then she was put into the water after she was dead. Meaning that when that car went into that lake, she was already gone. She was dead. Based on the fact that she was found outside of the truck, when Peter said she was still in the truck when the car, when he got out of the water, it's and based on the, her personal items being in the back of the bed of the truck, it was determined that she had to have been killed and then put into the bed of the truck. The truck was then driven casually, basically, into the lake because no one heard or saw anything either. Like, no one heard the sound of screeching tires or screaming or a truck going into the lake. No one heard it. They also determined, like, how on earth could they have gotten that lucky that they just so happened to go into the only opening on this entire long stretch of road? How did that happen? I mean, that's that's some luck right there. Well, bad luck, but... And they also searched the area for deer. They didn't find... They never found a single deer in that entire area. And as a matter of fact, according to people who live in that neighborhood and police and other people, they've never seen deer in that area. So how did they all of a sudden, Peter and Patty, see this deer in this area that they're not normally in? So nothing about Peter's story made sense. Well, then once he's presented with all of this, he changes his story. He says, well, okay, what I originally told you wasn't true. What actually happened was is that Patty, she got drunk that night and then she, we went to go pick up the kids and for some reason, I guess he just let her drive the truck drunk with him in it. Weird. And that she was suicidal that night and she drove into the lake on purpose to kill herself and to kill Peter. That was what her plan was. But again, her blood alcohol level suggested she was not even close to being drunk. She was below the legal limit she was fine-ish. So even that story didn't make sense. Well, they did some digging into their life and they found out that they had a, a babysitter. According to the babysitter, Patty had approached this babysitter with this idea of, hey, would you like to have a three-way with me and Peter? According to the babysitter, this is what actually occurred. They had this like three-way affair type thing. The babysitter said, well, yeah, I mean, Patty, she was back to being an alcoholic again even though no one in her life, family, friends, coworkers, could say that was true. They actually said that's far from the truth. She was pretty much off of alcohol, at least in, you know, drinking in high amounts. She had like the occasional drink. And then they found out that Peter was kind of infatuated with this babysitter, that the two of them, based on what other people were saying, had this kind of secret relationship. And so that to police says, well, that's motive right there. They also discovered that within like less than a week after she died, he was calling about the life insurance policy because there was one where he would get a bunch of money. What life insurance policy? Oh my God, that never happens in these types of stories ever. But he was already trying to collect it before she's even buried. He even tried to have her cremated before before they could do a second autopsy on her. And luckily he failed to get her cremated. And that's how they discovered that she actually suffocated and didn't drown. So they actually end up arresting Peter Wolasic and charging him with the murder of Patty. The, the evidence they have against him is for the most part circumstantial. They don't have like his physical DNA, hair, fingerprints or anything on anything to indicate he actually killed her himself like directly. They don't have that physical evidence, but they had a ton of circumstantial evidence, plus the fact that he lied a few times. What they believe happened is that they got into some kind of argument at their house and that he suffocated Patty until she was dead. And then he dragged her out of the house. And as he did so, she got those burdock seed pod things in her hair and her clothing. And they also tested Peter's shoes that he was wearing that night. He also had those burdock seeds in his shoes, the same ones. And so at that point, he loads Patty into the bed of the truck and then he drives to the location where there is that one opening on that road and he drives it at a relatively normal speed into the lake. And then what they think happened is because he wasn't suffering from hypothermia, he wasn't, his body temperature was relatively normal. He didn't have, he wasn't shivering or anything like that. They believe that after he put the vehicle into the lake, he just kind of went in there and kind of just like 
put water on him to look like he had been in the water. And then he ran to go get, you know, help. Some of the biggest mistakes he made, not checking her for those little seed pods and also not putting her in the vehicle itself. He left her in the bed of the truck thinking, I don't know what he was thinking. I mean, that's just stupid. His defense, he would hire his own scuba divers for his defense. And they, according to him and his scuba team, they did find burdock seeds or pods at the bottom of that lake. But then the prosecutors uh, people said, absolutely not, uh, because they don't thrive in water. They don't grow in water. They're not water plants. They're not even typically on the banks of like lakes. They're more like a weed almost. But it was ultimately the burdock plant that opened the entire scenario into making them think, oh, this was definitely not an accident. This was not a, a simple driving into a lake, you know, swerving off the road type thing. Those burdock plants, because they were present specifically at the Wallasics' home and not anywhere near the crime scene, pointed to them that she was dead and killed before she ever got into that lake. And it really was that those plants that actually kind of sealed the deal. The jury would deliberate for only a few hours and they came back with guilty. Peter Wlasic was found guilty of the murder of Patty and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. From what I understand, I think he's actually gone through a couple of trials for this case. He's won appeals and whatnot, but in recent years, he has lost appeals and he has since remarried. He has a new wife and his new wife has been trying to get justice for him, stating that he is innocent, that all they had was circumstantial evidence. They had no physical proof. The plants don't really tell the story. And while it's true, there just isn't that physical evidence. I mean, there's just isn't that really that says that he physically touched her and strangled her or suffocated her it, it's he was with her that night i mean he by his own account he was with her that night and they can say how she died and she didn't die by drowning and they can say well those plants were only at your house and how did they get all over her body without her noticing and taking them off of her while she's in this car. How did you not notice them on her? Like, you know, it's, it's just odd. And so the circumstantial evidence, while it is circumstantial, was still pretty strong. The fact that he lied and told two very different stories about what actually occurred, and none of them were even true. The accident recreation showed that he she did not swerve. There was no there was no skin marks. There the car was driven normally into that lake. There was no deer in that area. He was by his own account, he was in, he said he was in that water for several minutes, but he had no signs of hypothermia. Everything was just, it was all against him. And, you know, at this point, you kind of have to go, yeah, he's guilty. I mean, he, it can only have been him. And what did he do it for? Well, the two motives that we all know, well, money and love. And now he's in prison for at least... I'm not sure when he's up for parole. I'm probably pretty soon because this happened in 2002 and he got 25 years before he can ask for parole. So he's probably due for parole sometime soon. But, you know, if he really is the killer, then hopefully he does not get paroled and he's not get released. And this new wife that's trying to get him justice, well, maybe you shouldn't do that because he's already killed one wife, at least, allegedly. I'm sorry, but I think he did it. I think he did it. He had to have done it. If I was on that jury, I would say, yeah, I mean, the guy did it. I would definitely find him guilty. And so, thanks to Peter's lies and thanks to a plant, a seed pod, Patty Wolasik got the justice she rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, hi, my name is Mike. If you're new to the channel, I tell true crime stories, obviously, here. And I tell multiple true crime stories a week. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. Uh, you can find the links to my TikTok pages in the link tree in the description of this video. You will also find the links pop up here at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. And then, um, so yeah, feel free to follow it if you want. Also in that link tree, you will see my merch store. We have like t-shirts like this, the owl did it. 
kind of thing and other shirts and hoodies and stuff we do ship all over the world so feel free to check that out if you want to and then lastly if there's a case you want me to uh, cover you can recommend a case to my email my email is listed in the description and then just send me the name of the case where it happened and when it happened I'll add that case to my list. The list is very, very long. It's over 6,300 names long. I pick the cases I cover each time at random, to be fair. So I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will cover it eventually. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Anyway, that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. So as I always say goodbye to y'all, um, suck a juicy wet fart out of a butthole with a twisty straw, folks. Shit, that is not how you say goodbye. It's also kind of gross. Oh well, that's what is what it is. But it is. It is. Yeah. <clears throat> mm hmm.